Welcome to the second episode of the Thoughts Podcast. I am Paul Oluwadare, back with my second episode, yet another fitness influencer, or should I say personal trainer? I don't like a man of many talents and actually knows the stuff about fitness. Jake Colley Davis. How you doing, bro? Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Better now we're, uh, we're having a chat now. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. We've been trying to do this for a little while. I was... My life was a little hectic, just moving moving in and out of uni, from uni to home, just ugh, a little hectic, but we're here now. Yeah. So that leads me to my first question, which is, why, di- why did you start your fitness journey? And why did you start making content? Um, okay, so it's, those are probably two different questions for me. So the why I started my fitness journey, probably... To be brutally honest, it's just like wasn't happy with the way that I looked. Um, it was quite a while ago now. It was probably like five or so years ago. Um, obviously, had uh, always been into sport, um, tried doing gym and stuff, but it was more just like going on the running machine and stuff. Obviously, I had no clue what I was doing. A lot of people came out of like high school or at high school. Some of the coaches like taught them how to lift and stuff. We had none of that, so... Um, when I went into college, I kind of started going to the gym, going to the gym, did a bit more rugby and yeah, just basically tried to get a bit more confidence and put on some muscle really, because I had absolutely none. Um, and then why why did I start making content? So first time I ever really made like content, I was tracking like my own stuff. So I had like an Instagram account, um, that's, that's gone now. That was, that was an old one. And I just put up like my lifts, my progress. And it's just for me and probably my friends. It was like a private account. Um, and then obviously that, that went away. As I came to uni, I started doing, um, I started studying my undergraduate, which was which is uh, BSc in sports conditioning, rehabilitation and massage. With that, I started learning some things and I thought, you know, why not start posting some stuff on Instagram and TikTok after I had already started documenting my journey. So I stopped the whole documenting thing about a year into uni. And then from then I started doing it more to, um, cause I thought it was something I wanted to do. I always enjoyed, uh, coaching like my friends. Um, I always had gym partners that I come in, I do their programs for them. They train with me and I absolutely loved it. I thought it was so rewarding. And I just thought, you know what maybe maybe i could get a job from this and started posting really hmm. so you mentioned how you started your journey with rugby um so how did like what kind of what what does it look like when you're strength training specifically for rugby what does it entail what's the diet like what's the exercise like um okay so strength training aspect um it, it's heavily focused on like getting stronger to well, obviously it's a, it's a, you need a lot of strength to do the sport just like pure strength also strength can help with like speed and agility and pretty much underpins everything so there's a huge emphasis emphasis on strength especially in the lower body um your full body as well but mostly because the lower body is included in the full body so it's nice to get big and strong for your upper body um it does help but there's nothing that's going to really do better for your performance than just getting a real big squat. So that's what I'd say, probably leg training at least twice a week, probably three times a week in the off season. That's not including running training and um, sprinting. So no wonder rugby players have such, such meaty legs. Um, All right. Sorry about that. (laughs) Just had to deal with something real quick, but we're back. So you're talking about the training in rugby you recommended training legs especially during the off season three times a week and having a heavy squat and how that was helpful you were about to go into nutrition if I wasn't mistaken yeah yeah for sure so uh, you got to eat a lot especially if you're training a lot so um the kind of bare minimum and we weren't really training that much compared to a lot of teams we were training twice a week but we were also having one quite often two games a week as well so um when you're putting in all of your resistance training as well it's like it's a ridiculous amount of calories that you're burning so um it was a lot of force feeding when i was trying to put on weight um you know dominoes um i think i I actually managed to i did try doing like a full two for tuesdays and getting two of the large dominoes one time but 
I didn't quite manage it. That, that was rough. Um, but imagine. but yeah, it's a lot of calories. Like bodybuilders, like talk about how much calories they have to eat, and they're hardly working out. Like they're obviously big, but the amount of exercise, the amount of hours of actual exercise that some are like, especially the forwards, considering they're still 120 kilos, some of them 130 kilos. It's thousands and thousands and thousands of calories. So nutrition wise, a lot of food, meals every probably like four to four to six to seven meals every day um and then obviously a nice serving of beer um on the side especially if we got two games a week then it was pretty much drinking on a wednesday um and same again on a saturday after we played especially if we've won it's impossible not to go out so yeah lots of food lots of training yeah definitely in uni i remember seeing the rugby society when i was in huddersfield and boy do those people go up to a lot but I can understand why they do it. Because if you're taking hits all the time, you best believe I'm going to get like absolutely hammered on the Wednesday night. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so might leads me on to my next question with content creation. Obviously, you're on TikTok and that's how I found your content. And it's kind of through TikTok. I have noticed a lot of people that go to the gym, as you mentioned earlier, whether they're tracking their progress, whether they're being informative or motivational, it's generally became that platform for like for people in our age range to, you know, mm. talk about fitness. And it's kind of became the place outside of books and at formal education, you would go to learn the real stuff you need to know to make progress in the gym. Because whilst you have the people like yourself, like myself occasionally, and like um, Jack Beddle, who I interviewed in my first episode, who will try and talk about the right things, will show you the right, the proper ways of lifting and all the things that go into actually making progress into the gym. You also kind of get your people that are just trying to shove a untested, unverified kind of method or substance yeah. like down like down the pipeline. So what's your process like? How do you think of the content you want to create and then put it out step by step really? Um so Obviously, so obviously, a lot of my stuff is evidence based. So it's come from. Um, oh, I'm in my fourth year now, my fourth year um, of uni. So there's a lot of research and evidence that kind of formed the way that I think. Um, I haven't been training for like 10, 15, 20 years, like some of the other coaches out there. So um, a lot of their stuff might come down to experience. Whereas I've tried to obviously get all the experience I can, and we're filling the holes with. Um, doing as much research as I possibly can. Um, so I kind of fit the fill the gaps between them. Additionally, I started off like obsessed with bodybuilding. So for like the first three years, it was purely like just trying to get as big as possible, pretty unsuccessfully, I might add. But um, I then kind of converted from bodybuilding over to sports performance. Um, and now I've got kind of like a unique take that involves a bit of both, which is which is nice. Um, so I kind of like to put that unique spin on it. Um, that would be one thing. I try and it is a it is very random the kind of content that I come out with. Uh, luckily with TikTok, the engagement, especially with the comments, is really really good on TikTok, and um, you just don't get that on Instagram or on anything else really. So obviously with the reply function, I can reply with videos, and that's just made content creation so much easier. Um, I, I do make more videos from scratch than I do like replying to comments. But when I read through the comments as well, I get like a gist of, okay, this is what people want to know. Um, this is what people are confused about. And then lastly, something I strayed away, strayed away from a little bit, um, but what I did more at the start was like duet or stitch videos um, and basically be like, look, this just isn't the one or this is what could be done better. Um, the problem with that was that it, it's very hard to do that in a way that isn't condescending or putting somebody else down because when someone does it to me, I feel awful. Um, and it's just the way it is. I feel very defensive. And so I don't like doing that too much to people unless they're blatantly just doing it with absolute disregard and it's damaging the people that are kind of following their advice. But yeah, so I'd say the comments and the people are absolutely shaping the kind of content that I go into. Um, and then when I'm filming my sessions, I film pretty much all my sets when I work out anyway. And then I think, okay, cool. 
um, let's make a video about this today. Let's make a video about that. Uh, and then I've got the videos already and I can just kind of go in there and make the content. Right, right, right. And you mentioned the stitching and duets feature because that is one of the first ways I think I found your content, funnily enough, like through the FYP and then through obviously just seeing seeing people's content, seeing other people stitch it, whether they agree or not. But then I feel like fitness, when you get to a lot of people saying generally the right kind of thing, you mm-hmm. get to a stage where you have people critiquing and really splitting hairs on what's optimal, what's the best way to gain mass. And at what point in my head sometimes, I feel like at what point is this just, you're saying your way is better because it's your way versus there actually being a, a real major difference. Like doing a lap pull down is a lap pull down, but then, oh, the JPG style is slightly more optimal. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah can- I mean, it's, yeah, it is a tough one. They're, they're, everyone's going to have opinions, um, especially in the evidence-based community at the moment. There's a lot of people that, um, obviously, like I said, I'm evidence-based, so it's nothing against any of them. And um, uh, I'm friends with quite a lot of the other TikTokers who really go directly down that route. Um, of just being as optimal as possible the problem is is less so with the creators and more so with the people that are engaging with them so um, they'll be like this is the most optimal thing and then everybody will take these things that are in a very specific content context of this exact movement for your bicep is going to be the best but that doesn't mean that you should really be focusing on that unless you've got every single other thing nailed which the chances are you don't um, and that's kind of where like I like to fit in like a mixture between the evidence-based bodybuilding stuff and then the, the practical coaching side. And it's really hard like with the demographic. There are a lot of very young, impressionable lads. Um, so I, 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 can't, I don't know the exact age range um, for my TikToks, but for me, I know it's lads. It's, it's 90% lads who um, follow my stuff. But from what I've gathered, they're mostly like 14 to 16 year olds very very impressionable and they'll do exactly what you say and when I was younger when I started out I would I would basically focus on all the wrong things I'd put all my energy into trying to look at like my calories and my macros and get them perfect to the exact calorie every single day even if that meant like spitting out one grain of rice like it's ridiculous um, and instead, I should have just been listening to the advice that was less specific, more general, and was just focusing on the progressive overload, the eating enough, and making sure my form was right. And I thought I was doing all of that, but I just spent so much time and energy focusing on the, the little, what I thought at the time was the little optimal things, and just didn't look at the macro, the, the, the bigger picture, which I think is a big problem at the moment. Mm. So you've kind of just answered funnily enough at least two of my follow-up questions which would have been like what has content creation taught you all this stuff so this like the reason your kind of content really does get to me where it's like evidence where it's evidence-based but it's also like generally you need to make sure you're nailing the basics because I feel like people get wrapped up in a lot of this optimal stuff but then they forget the basics even I even Mm -hmm. I fall victim to it as your everyday average gym goer and I feel like by having more people just sit like constantly having to reinforce the understanding of you need to nail the basics before you worry about every single little calorie that goes into your body. And the more people like you that are out there, the better the training of the 14 year old who's just entering the gym for the first time, who doesn't really know how to bench press, how to squat or how to deadlift is going to be the better that start is going to be for those people whether they're teenagers or young boys coming out of high school or just adults for the first time in their life trying to take their fitness seriously. And so this leads me on to my next question because I'm running out of time, apparently, according to Zoom. (laughs) Um, Hold on, let me just check my notes quickly. What does your success look like? When would you know or when would you feel like you've succeeded with content creation and fitness? What is that point for you? That's a really good question. Um, I kind of like ask myself that multiple times a day um, without actually answering it. So that is something I, I've kind of got to get to, got to get a grip on. Um, I'm not really too sure. Every time like I get towards a goal, I just obviously go to the next one. So in terms of like my specific goals for this year, 
Um, originally, it was to get to 30,000 followers. Um, and then if I beat that, then 50,000. 30,000 is going to be absolutely possible and 50,000 could be as well. Um, I'd be super happy with that. But then once I've ticked something like that off, it's, it's obviously on to the next thing. I, it, I feel like a lot of um, social media stuff is very momentum based. And I'm, I'm afraid that if I take my foot off the gas, if I take my foot off the pedal, I'm going to lose that momentum. And I know I've done that before. Uh, and regretted it so obviously the big number for me would be a hundred thousand uh in terms of the followers um and on tiktok and for instagram that'll be ten thousand. like these are just lovely round numbers that i'd love to love to love to meet but i think that the most important thing for me outside of content creation is like how it kind of feeds into my business so um obviously I do the online coaching stuff and for me if I can do that as my full-time job and not have to worry about uh paying the bills then that's when I'm going to be that's when I'm going to be happiest and I think yeah I think that'll be my end goal really that's really good um my next question was going to be how do you feel about a lot of the fitness community? Because I feel as though you have this weird mix of, you have your optimal trainers, you have your people that are saying complete nonsense at the bottom, your optimal trainers who vary in degrees of how optimal, then you have your people who are very much like me, where they're kind of just don't have any formal qualifications, but they've made incredible progress in the gym mm -hmm. by just following the fundamentals but some of them have now gone on to try and sell programs and sell these kind of things, which is kind of a gray area for me because yes, they've made progress by doing the right things. Obviously there's 17 year olds out there with incredible physiques that 30 year olds would dream of, but you don't have, in my opinion, at least that formal understanding. Yes. You have the understanding relative to your own body and your own progress from 14 to 17 or whatever age range, but because of their lack of, qualifications i question why they should really be allowed to do that sure. honestly for sure yeah i mean it absolutely is a gray area um even for myself who's i guess you could call me a qualified coach the thing is you you don't actually have to have any qualifications to do online coaching and say you're a coach like you can just you can absolutely just do it like everyone else is the main the main thing is i think the most important thing as a coach is about putting everything together, knowing when, to, having every tool in your box and knowing when to use every single one of those tools. So it doesn't matter if you know absolutely every little optimal bit of information, if you then have somebody that would benefit from something or would benefit from just doing your compound movements as most people would when they start out. There's no point worrying about these movements. You can teach them about them but I wouldn't bother doing them. They need to focus most of their time on all these other things. So like I said, tools in your box and those tools can come from experience. Those tools can come from online, like watching stuff online. Those tools can come from actual coaching experience, coaching other people, or they could come from um, a qualification. But at the end of the day, you have, you have to have a balance of all of them or else it's just not, it's, it's not, not really going to be, not really going to be good enough. And I think this is this is the main problem with not the people that post the stuff on TikTok, but with the idea of TikTok itself. So you have all of these people giving out these little bits of information, myself included, and you're expecting that piece of information to apply to absolutely everybody that sees it. And you've got to trust that the algorithm is going to know exactly what you're on about um, and direct that to the exact people. And it, it just doesn't work like that. So even without, even within... So 25,000 followers, most of the videos I put out there, I wouldn't be surprised if they're really only targeted at like 1,000, 2,000 of them. And then all of the other ones would probably benefit from a slight different spin on what I'm saying. So if I'm saying about focusing on your compounds, there might be an elite level um, rugby player who's watching my stuff and goes, oh, okay, maybe I don't need to be focusing on all of these plyometrics and all these funky exercises because he said I want to focus on my compound. Well, if you've already built a ridiculous amount of strength, you're squatting 200 plus kilos and you're benching 140 kilos and you've got all of your movement patterns, okay, yeah, mate, that's when it's your time to focus on all these little special things. Um, so it's difficult. I feel 
I feel like I'm trying to put stuff out there to suit everybody, but I also know if I do that, it's not going to suit everybody. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, it's a hard, it's a tough one. It's a, you can't really have a one size fits all when it comes to fitness. Yeah, yeah. And as we're rounding off, because I can see I have literally one minute on the clock. Um, what's your advice to content creators in the fitness industry or looking to create content around fitness? Um, I would say, I'm not going to say the generic thing and be like, be yourself. But if, if you're going to say something, be really confident with it. If you're not confident enough of what you're saying, then you probably don't know enough about the topic and then you probably shouldn't say it so i've had this problem a lot of times and i've gone to say something i've recorded a video and then i've gone you know what i'm not even sure if what i'm saying is right i'll go away and do some more research i'll confirm what i'm saying is right if it's right i'll do it if it's not right i'll learn more about it and then i'll do it um so that kind of like i did have a lot of anxiety about like are people going to stitch this i still do to a certain extent are people going to disagree um but yeah just make sure you're confident with what you're putting out there. If it's telling somebody how to do something and if it's just your own lifts, do whatever you want, put up your own lifts. And if you're not trying to tell somebody to do something, then, um, you know, you're absolutely fine. Awesome. And to be honest, as we round off, I completely understand where you come from with the anxiety of being stitched or corrected. But personally, I find it almost a good thing to leave them on because at least in my niche, because I've done advice videos around uni and stuff like that, if you've ever seen my content. But like, at least in what I do, it just kind of allows me to get better informed and can just kind of understand different people's experiences mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So yeah, it's been a great time talking to you. It's been Likewise. really fun just kind of hearing this information from someone who is verified in what they do and has experienced both playing a sport at an elite level and understanding exercise to an elite level. And I wish you nothing but the best. I am grateful you. for your time. Thank you so much, man. Yeah.